Hi there. Let's talk about graphic narratives. In this lecture, we're going to examine the origin of what becomes known as comics, spelled with an X. This is the rise of independent comic artists who were really self-employed making comics for a new audience. To begin with, the idea of comics that could be subversive or question the status quo, really was put forward by Ad Reinhardt, who was a serious abstract artist who worked as an illustrator for a progressive magazine known as PM Newspaper. PM Newspaper was interesting for a number of different reasons. It didn't allow for any advertisements. It sold its paper to working class, democratic, labor unions, people who had socialist or even communist ideologies. And it was meant to really address the news during the war and bring about a critical discourse to the mainstream press. Ad Reinhardt worked for this newspaper and he did a number of these illustrations His cartoon style was fairly basic, and what he wanted to do was call attention to the problems of representation. In that newspaper, he was given a chance to create a series of editorial cartoons called How to Look. And in this series, he used collage as a way of commenting on the absurdity of images and the way things and meanings are subverted in art. And so he creates these collaged pictures, and throughout there are these little humorous anecdotes, one of which is this man who's laughing at an abstract painting. Ha ha, what does this represent? And then the painting scolds him back. What do you represent? as if the painting needs to be seen on its own terms, and it shouldn't be a window into a world that we can interpret, but it is something that we are there to experience, like another person. One of the ideas that Ed Reinhardt put forward in his editorial comic pages on the meanings of art was how to make a political cartoon using just about any image. In it, he took a picture of a woman whose toe is being bitten by a crab, and he started attaching different labels to them. And he showed how just attaching different labels, instead of painting, that could be social consciousness or democracy. Instead of pictures, it could be local fascists or banality. This way in which You could attach new meanings to things that are already there. You didn't need to create a new picture. You could employ old pictures with new content. As he said, all you need to make a political cartoon is a picture, some labels, and some paste. We can see that in his comics uh, that were his editorials, How to Look Comics, where he's using in this really irreverent way all this different kinds of art throughout art history and using it in this dissociative way to create a kind of conversation about the nature of art and how it works. Ed Reinhardt actually got a fair amount of pushback from his editorial cartoons. He was a very strident man, and a lot of the working class people who read the paper found that he was his tone condescending and he didn't appreciate the kind of art that they enjoyed, which tended to be more conservative. The other organization, which had no direct connection to Ad Reinhardt, was in France, and they were called the International Situationist. And they were a radical communist group under the direction of Guy Dubord, who had a number of theories about art. And one of these was very important, was this idea that art was problematic because it dealt with spectacle, and it was tied into 
capitalism through its spectacle. It created an opportunity for people to become absorbed into the capitalist society and become non-critical of the way they received messages. So they came up with this idea called detournement, which means basically just to redirect, divert. And detournement was the strategy they employed to take something, a quote, and twist it, make people see language and pictures in a new way by combining them in abrupt dissociative manner. The strategy they ultimately settled on was to take comic book pages, cut up the panels, erase any original content in the speech bubbles or speech balloons, and then insert their own communist manifestos into the speech bubbles. So while it would look like an ordinary comic, it would in fact be a diatribe on communism and the the evils of the capitalist system. So with this strategy at hand, they began to remake these and publicize them and use this as a way to kind of people thinking they're looking at a comic and then be startled at the actual content that they were experiencing. And they saw this as really important, this disruptive way in which the spectacle could be used against itself. And they found this idea of deuteronomy really fascinating. All you could do, all you needed to do, was attach a speech bubble to something, anything, and it became subversive. One of the early extended comics that they created that really capitalized on this strategy, pun intended, The Return of the Deruti Column by André Bertrand. Now, this was actually supposed to be just a sort of advertisement for another publication that they were really spending a lot of money on. This was a very simple comic published on 11 by 17 page, folded over, and it was distributed free to the students at a occupation of the student union that they were orchestrating. And what happened was this became the real rallying cry for this movement. A lot of the writing of the situation international was pretty opaque. It was difficult to understand, and it was convoluted in its argument. But the comics that they created were very immediate. They were funny, they were irreverent, and they really crystallized the argument that they were making in a very fundamental way. Again, bringing in classic works of art and images of anarchists and movie stills, and they put them together into this this crazy way that provided this new forum for critique. Here, in this very famous panel of that comic, Return of the Deruti Column, we can see Their knowledge of life owed nothing to their sporadic presence in the inner sanctum of university colleges and departments, not to various diplomas they had acquired, but by the most diverse and least respectable means. And so we see these two cowboys saying, What exactly is your main concern? Reification. I see. That's serious work. With thick books and lots of paper on a big table? No. I wander around. Mostly, I just wander around. Now, this way in which they're talking about this is sort of funny. The idea of reification means to take something that uh, is an illusion, the idea that the capitalist society is essential to the workings of our lives, and take that apart. So the question of reification is central to the very nature of the university itself. So he's questioning why we go to school and what authority school actually has over our lives. There's a really irreverent quality to this comic. I especially like this panel where they took the hand of Lenin and had it reach back into the previous panel and help grope this woman. And so this way in which they took even the most 
important icons of communism and we were willing to subvert them as well. And their last line of this comic, I think, is really important. They say in big, bold letters, now it is your turn to play. And play to the situations was subversive. It meant non-productive work. It meant pushing back against the capitalist expectations that you are doing uh, and being productive to the, your greatest ability and capacity all the time. So these posters and comics that they were made in, in France and were circulated during the student protests that took over the country in 68 became widespread throughout the counterculture in the United States. As people began to see and experience this new strategy for showing ways of communicating subversive content. And you can see this appear in this reprinted and translated version of this French original a year later in the Berkeley Barb, an independent publisher in California. So in the Deruti column, we clearly see the idea of this subversive way of even handling someone as important as Lenin. Later on, that very same image would be altered in the United States. They weren't quite willing to be so playful or subversive, and they took their message and the icons of communism much more seriously than the French original. And this is a really important shift away from this idea of irreverent play, where nothing is sacred that the original use of detournement in the United States was more selective in its targets. The alternative press, like I mentioned before, the Berkeley Barb, began in 1967. It ran through the 1980s and was an important venue for a lot of up-and-coming illustrators and artists who wanted to employ their talents toward the new ideology, the hippie culture that was emerging at this time. And this became a really important venue for a lot of things. These newspapers were possible because printing technology had been getting cheaper and cheaper, and that used printing presses and uh, people were able to pick up and build their own Um, media outside the mainstream. Because these printing costs were going down, some artists, such as Robert Klum, decided to publish their own comics. He created the entire thing himself, cover art and all the content inside. And he had taken it to this publisher, and the publisher, being a notorious hippie, lost all his artwork. Frustrated, he had a s- photocopies of that, but he went ahead and published what was going to be number two as number one. And then when he finally had a chance to redraw all his original artwork, he called it number zero. Inside number zero, which was, was intended to be the original Zap comics, we see cosmic capers which is a metamorphosis of a suburban landscape turning into a yin-yang symbol or what's known in China as uh, Tai Chi or the supreme ultimate, and it vanishes into nothing. These psychedelic comics, Robert Crumb sold on the street. He literally had a baby pram that he pushed up and down and for 35 cents, hippies could have a little entertainment with their weed. Robert Crumb created a lot of really amazing and memorable characters. Perhaps his most successful character was based on a cat that he had growing up as a kid. And this character uh, featured in a number of things. This horny, 'er ne'er-do-well animal person was always uh, a terrible misogynist and going around um, treating women terribly. Finally, one of the characters had had absolutely enough of his misbehavior, 
and stabs him in the head with an ice pick. And so that was the end. Now, why would Robert Crumb destroy his most popular and his most successful character? He was always very suspicious of success, and he really never wanted to be a sellout. And this is a really interesting idea that gains a lot of currency at this time, even though comics had been used for decades as a really powerful way to market things. He really wanted his creativity not to be guided by commercial interests. And so he would often destroy or get rid of characters just at the height of their popularity. Another character that he explored was the character of White Man, who was this uptight, straight, white person who found himself obsessed uh, with all kinds of deviant behavior. And a lot of Crumb's comics do that. What we see is a sort of normal world beneath the surface is just seething with corruption and degradation. Another character that became very popular with Robert Crumb was his very moral, upstanding Mr. Natural. This sort of bald-headed guy with the beard would often have a more spiritual bent and move away from things that were materialistic. And he becomes a kind of moral authority in a lot of Crumb's comics. Crumb himself appears in his own comics as a sexual deviant and a person who has serious trouble uh, with boundaries. And A lot of people have since accused him of misogyny and other uh, ways in which he abused and manipulated women to his own uh, perverse ends. He's very critical of himself. And I think in light of what we know about Robert Crumb, that he played a very important role supporting women artists. His own wife, Elaine Crumb, is a cartoonist he has worked with for many years. His images are disturbing, and I think we are meant to be repulsed by them and repulsed by him, by the way in which he engages in this. And I understand that this is and can be a shocking thing. The next slide is especially shocking for many people. And Robert Crumb has been repeatedly criticized for his racist caricatures. And I think he would defend himself by saying that he was trying to call out what was and existed in American culture in the past and present. The exaggeration and the excess in which he makes these caricatures is where he gets his sense of unbridled license. Of course, it's very problematic that he is a white man making these caricatures and that he is profiting off of these racist stereotypes. Robert Crumb has a long history of having a fascination with the past, and a lot of his work seems to reflect the art styles of the 1920s, especially Max Fleischer cartoons. He did this nostalgia to his work. And even though his characters are engaged in modern activities, there is a retro style that moves against the idea of progress and the future. Underground comics would be eventually sold in what became known as the head shop. Record stores, paraphernalia, posters, and underground comics were prominently featured in these stores. Captain Ed's in Los Angeles, first established in 1967, and then from 1968 to 1975, they proliferated across the country as an important outlet for underground newspapers and comics and counterculture cartoonists who had very little access to established newsstand distribution. And this really challenges the distribution of comics in general. 
they kind of move away from the magazine stands where something would be published for a month, and then it would be returned to the publisher where it would be pulped at the end of that time to make way for new content. In the head shop, things didn't go out of date like that. People were willing to have it sit around for a while until it found an appreciative audience. And so head shops bought the comics outright at a discount with the understanding they would never return them. And this is the beginning of a new kind of market for comics. Eventually, head shops came up against the Nixon administration's war on drugs and the 1973 Supreme Court ruling, Miller v. California, that found local communities could decide their own First Amendment standards concerning obscenity, and a lot of head shops had their content confiscated and shut down. In head shops, you might find a poster like this, which seems to harken back to the days of detournement. But the real legacy of the Situationists is actually can be found in the punk rock. Uh, Jamie Reed was a Situationist who became the advertising muscle behind the band Sex Pistols, and he used the strategy very effectively to brand the band and create these subversive messages for their audience. Punk rock was decisively anti-hippie, aggressively modern, and against all forms of authority. It would be this style that would move the idea of determinement into the present. Unfortunately for punk rockers, they never really understood the origins of this strategy, and the word determinement would fade from knowledge And today we would see this idea, the subversive strategy, appear in everything from the Onion newspaper and the Colbert Report. Both of those use this idea of news source that is somehow subversive. It's telling you something as if it were actual real news. But it is a parody of itself and subversive to the idea of authentic news.